So good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Grosvenor Business School. And thank you once again for joining us for uh, Business Over Breakfast. When we began this series at the beginning of April, we had no idea that our world would be so changed for such a long time. And we would be so challenged in all aspects of our lives, uh, health, wealth, morals, social and emotional well-being. As an educational institution, we have an obligation to help people learn and grow so that professionals and executives like you can meet these challenges and create a better future for everyone. At Goizueta, we take this very seriously and we work hard to fulfill this obligation in many different ways, one of them being these weekly webinars. I wanted to take a moment this morning to give a shout out to the team of people who make this happen every week. Sarah, Lauren, Jasmine, Tiffany, Keisha, Christine, Pam, and the rest of the executive education team. Thank you very much. Today, we're going to explore the psychological strategies people use to manage uncertainty in times of recession and national crisis. Our academic guide to help us understand this is Emily Bianchi, Associate Professor of Organization and Management at Gorgeland Business School. Emily's research examines how the state of the economy shapes attitudes and, attitudes and behaviors, ranging from individualism to ethics. Her work also looks at how economic conditions in early adulthood influence later job attitudes, self-concepts, and moral behavior. And her work has been covered by um, the New York Times, The Atlantic, NPR's Marketplace, US Today, The Financial Times, Business Week, and many others. So once more, we are in very good hands as we explore this topic. Emily's going to kick off the webinar with some perspectives on how people deal with uncertainty, and then we will follow it with a Q&A. So please write your questions in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen and our team will do their best to get to as many of them as we can today. And remember uh, the three W's, which I keep telling my kids, uh, wear a mask, wash your hands and watch your distance and stay safe. And I'll see everybody next Thursday morning. Thank you and uh, have a great day. Thanks, Emily. Thank you so much. I hadn't heard those three W's before, but I'm going to start using that with my kids as well. Um, I am really pleased to be here today. Um, it is um, exciting to be back um, in front of, of people I have not teaching this semester um, in, in a very different capacity than I'm used to, but you know, this is what this moment is, is asking of all of us is to do things that we are um, not used to. So I want to take you back for a minute um, to a time that most of you will remember. Um, and that is the Great Recession, right? So if you go back to 2009, 2010, you probably remember um, a time period when millions of Americans were suddenly out of work, when the unemployment rate was higher than it had been since, you know, the Great Depression uh, generations earlier. And for every job opening, there were six people actively looking. Right. For many of our own graduates um, from college, from, from, from um, graduate school, you know, we were finding that people were taking jobs that, that they had in high school. Um, and venerable companies that you know, seemed like they would be around forever um, were suddenly um, falling quickly. Millions of Americans lost their homes. Um, millions uh, were found themselves underwater in their mortgages, owing more than their home was worth. And during this time, I was a graduate student in New York. And New York felt, um, it, it felt like the world just kind of collapsed within a very short period of time. So, you know, within several months, it, it just, it felt like everybody was moving differently, um, that everywhere you went, you saw signs that things um, had changed pretty drastically in a very short period of time. Um, and, you know, there were fewer people on the subway. It just every, it, it was one of those things that you, you couldn't really forget. And that launched my interest that has stayed with me some, since that time of understanding how people respond to recessions, of how people respond to crises more broadly. Um, and since that time, I have looked both at how kind of young adults are shaped by these moments um, in ways that they carry for a really long time to come, 
but also how all of us are affected by these moments and how recessions tend to make us more interdependent with other people. Uh, they also tend to make us um, more likely to discriminate against people who are not members of our in-group. Um, they um, have implications for ethical behavior and many, many other outcomes. But one of the common themes through all of these different projects I've worked on over the years, and, and I'm going to be drawing from research from many, many other people as well today. But one of the themes that we see again and again in recessions and in other crises as well is that the psychological prevailing sense during these times is one of uncertainty. That during recessions, there is so much uncertainty about what the future holds. Right. Will this ever end? Will jobs come back? How long are we going to be in this state? Um, and you saw this in the Great Recession. For instance, a there were a series of economists who did um, studies in which they analyzed the use of the word uncertainty in American newspapers. And what they found was that during the recession, it increased precipitously. So, um, you know, the use of that word um, was much more prevalent. And this was especially true in states that were really hard hit, right? So one of the fascinating aspects of the Great Recession was that some states were hit really hard, others uh, less so. And so what you see is manifestations of uncertainty um, in states that were hit really hard, states like Nevada, like Michigan, uh, less so in states like Nebraska, um, where the unemployment rate didn't increase that um, drastically. So this prevailing sense of uncertainty has, has really driven much of my research on recessions. And um, you know, certainly when I started that work, I would have never um, anticipated um, the extra layer of uncertainty that we are all experiencing right now. Right? So um, we've technically been um, in a recession um, according to you know, the, the NBER, National Bureau of Economic Research, um, uh, you know, states that we're currently in a recession. Um, and so we have the usual economic anxiety, right? Um, you know, you know are so many, many people are unemployed, there are concerns about you know, many, many financial concerns. But this particular period has added another layer of uncertainty, um, which only heightens um, this psychological experience, right? There's another layer of, of, of health uncertainty. Right. Many people are asking, you know, will I get sick? Um, will someone I love get sick? Is it safe to visit my relatives? Um, if you're a parent, um, will my kids ever, ever uh, go back to school? Um, that is a, a tremendous level of uncertainty that I don't think most parents could have ever imagined a year ago. Um, you know, will life go back to normal? When? What will the new normal look like? Um, you know, will, when will I ever feel comfortable going to a concert again, right, to a movie theater? Um, you know, how is this going to change us for a really long period of time? Um, you know, will there be a vaccine? Will it be effective? All of these sorts of questions um, are, have presented a tremendous amount of uncertainty. In fact, the amount of collective uncertainty we are experiencing right, right now for most Americans is unlike anything we have ever faced. And most of us find this incredibly unsettling and uncomfortable. And we are motivated to get rid of that feeling, to do things to offset that sense of not knowing, of unpredictability. People really, really hate uncertainty. And of course, like most uh, things in life, there, there's a tremendous amount of variation in this, right? There are some people who are better at handling it than others, um, but on average, most human beings really dislike it. In fact, we hate uncertainty so much that most people, studies show, would prefer a bad outcome to an unpredictable outcome. So to give you an example, there's been a whole bunch of research um, in which people have been invited into a lab and uh, to participate in a psychology study. And they know um, before they go that they, if the, this study, um, you might get a shock. Okay, so you might get a mild electric shock, nothing dangerous, but something, you know, 
most of us would rather not have. Okay, so imagine you're in one of two conditions. In one condition, you're told you are going to get five shocks over the next five minutes. They're going to come at one minute intervals and then you'll be done. Okay, so that's the certainty condition. Not a good condition. None of us want shocks, but at least you know when they're coming, how many of them there will be, and you can plan accordingly. On the other hand, say you're in the other condition, the uncertain condition. And in this condition, you're told you can, um, you may or may not get shocks, okay? You won't get any more than five, so no more than the people in the certain condition. Um, but it's, you know, it's uncertain or unpredictable, okay? You don't know when you're gonna get them, you don't know how many you're gonna get, okay? Now you can look at that as an uncertain situation, which it is, or you can look at it as like, hey, wow, I could be somebody who actually doesn't get shocked in this you know, electric shock study. But what researchers find again and again is that people overwhelmingly prefer the certain condition, knowing what they're gonna get, even if what they're gonna get is unpleasant, okay? Um, versus you know, the uncertain condition where they might not get any shocks and that would be great, but they don't know when they're coming and they don't know what it's going to be like. And we see this again and again um, in, in the psychology literature and the organizational behavior literature. And I think many of you can relate to this in your own lives and your own experiences. So for example, um, job insecurity, when you are worried about losing your job, okay, there's a tremendous amount of uncertainty around that. And researchers have found that people who feel high job uncertainty are show more negative physiological, psychological, health-related effects than people who have actually lost their job. So people who fear or you know sense that there's an uncertainty around whether they will remain employed are actually showing more negative responses than people who have actually had that bad outcome happen. Okay. Again, showing how much we hate uncertainty. And there are good evolutionary reasons that we hate uncertainty. Um, if we can, you know, we think of the modern brain as a, you know, in many ways as a vestige of, of a long ago time in which things were very different. Um, and if we think of it that way, we can understand why we would be hardwired to fear and dislike uncertainty. Um, when ancient humans entered an unfamiliar area, they never knew what might be lurking, right? They didn't know what danger might be around the corner. And they should be scared. They should have been scared. They should have been fearful. If they weren't, the result could be catastrophic, right? It could, it could end up being a life or death situation. And so we evolve such that uncertainty bred, breeds anxiety. It breeds fear. It makes us wary of doing things that are new and different. But of course, this system was developed from a very different time and place, but it still stays with us today. Most of the uncertain situations we encounter are not matters of life or death, yet our physiological and psychological reactions are the same as if they were. And we've seen this in the, you know, in, in the last six months in terms of reactions to COVID. Um, we've seen you know, that a record number of uh, Google searches for things like um, panic attacks, um, for, for uh, excessive worrying, for anxiety. Um, a majority of American adults have reported a, a significant increase in the amount of anxiety and fear that they have felt. And now in some ways that is quite adaptive, right? Because even though we're not trying to fight off a predator um, or worried about you know, encountering a volcano, we can take actions based on that fear, based on that anxiety. And many of us, most of us have, right? We have changed our behavior markedly um, to address the challenges that we collectively face. But I think we can all also recognize that our anxiety and fear continues and persists even beyond taking those corrective necessary actions. 
and continues to influence us in ways that are not as adaptive and in ways that are more problematic. And so if we can understand that uh, you know, we dislike uncertainty, that we um, really, really seek to minimize that feeling, um, we can see how people would use all sorts of compensatory strategies, is what we call them, to reduce that feeling of uncertainty. So strategies to get rid of that dis-ease, to get rid of that um, discomfort. And if you think about the, you know, on a, on a clinical level, um, there, you know, people who suffer from severe anxiety, who suffer from obsessive compulsive disorder, um, you know, use these compensatory strategies all the time, right? So you hear of people who, um, you know, are obsessively kind of reorganizing their space or they're obsessively washing their hands to a point that it's, it's debilitating and actually causing them harm. And those are compensatory strategies, right? Those are strategies designed to minimize one's feeling of uncertainty, right? And so that's a kind of clinical version of this. Um, but subclinically, we are all using these, many of these strategies all the time. And sometimes that's just fine. Sometimes they're adaptive, they're, um, you know, they have pro-social outcomes. But as I'll talk about today, other times they can be quite problematic. Um, they can be problematic in terms of how we manage the situation, um, and they can be problematic in terms of how we treat other people. So one strategy that, um, you know, and, and to be clear, there are dozens and dozens of strategies. I'm gonna cover some that are, are very common um, and that we've seen in recessions and that we're seeing right now. Um, one strategy that people use are conspiracy theories. Um, I recently read a paper in which the researchers identified more than 2,000 conspiracy theories that have come out of the current pandemic. And these aren't limited to one country. In fact, they span, um, the researchers found they spanned 87 different countries, 25 different languages, and, you know, concerned a lot of different things. Many of them concern the origins, theories about where COVID-19 came from, um, ideas about how it was created and whether, you know, usually in, in pretty um, dark ways. Um, many others of these conspiracy theories blame certain groups as being responsible for creating the virus. Um, others have focused on, you know, preventative measures that usually aren't based in science, um, you know, ways to cure oneself of COVID, um, again, which often aren't based in science. Um, but we see this in all sorts of crises. We see this in recessions. We see this um, in response to pandemics. And we can understand this if we understand kind of our aversion to uncertainty. Because what these conspiracy theories have in common, as remarkably different as they are, is that they seek to explain, right? They seek to provide order. They seek to explain seemingly random events. And as such, they seek to restore perceptual order, right? They seek, we are motivated to understand the world as a cohesive, ordered, predictable place. And an interesting aspect of these conspiracy theories is that often they're quite dark, right? Often they paint a world um, that is, is quite, um, you know, sinister and um, where people have uh, malintent. And even so, people seem to find comfort in them, right? Because they explain things, they provide order, they provide predictability. But of course, we can see how these perceptual strategies can be very costly, right? They can lead us to treat other people unfairly, um, to resist medical invention interventions, to avoid medical advice, um, to resist cooperation across countries that we, you know, might perceive as responsible or, or other groups that might be perceived as responsible. And we see this in all sorts of, of different crises, this, this um, increase in our desire to explain, um, in many senses, things that are not 
easily explainable. So that's one of the, the strategies I'm sure many of you have seen in this crisis. Um, another more positive strategy, and I've studied this a lot in recessions, um, is that uncertainty can, can, can encourage us to lean on other people. Um, so uncertainty in, in many ways can bring us together. Um, because if you think about when you experience uncertainty, it's unsettling, right? Um, you know, we're talking today about collective uncertainty, but we've all experienced individual uncertainty in our lives. And when we think about those moments, it's in all likelihood, we manage that by leaning on other people, by connecting, by identifying with other people. And that's a strategy that provides a lot of comfort um, to people in times of crisis. So for instance, when we, um, when we feel uncertainty, we do tend to kind of connect with other people. Again, that helps you know, provide comfort. Think how many times during the last um, six months that you've probably reached out and um, you know, talked to people in your, in your community about you know, what's going on and, and kind of the disease that you probably have felt. Um, it helps us make sense, right? We, we spend a lot of time in life making sense of the world around us. Uh, of trying to figure out what's going on. And we do a lot of this with discuss, talking with other people. So we find, for instance, that when people are new in organizations, um, when you're first starting a job, there is a, a, like, a higher likelihood of you trying to uh, you know, have casual conversations with your coworkers to try to understand what is the, what goes on around here. Right? What, how do things work around here? Who's really in charge? Who's nice? Who should I go do for help? Who should I avoid? Right? This is all, these are all sense-making strategies. And in March and April and May, when we found ourselves in our world completely upended in a relatively short period of time, um, many people leaned on other people to try to make sense of what was going on. Right? How long do we think we'll be out of school? How long do we think we'll be working remotely? Um, all of those kind of questions we collectively made sense with people in our communities. And also leaning on other people can help us understand, you know, what's normative here? Um, what are people actually doing? How are people managing this? What's appropriate? What's not appropriate? And we have seen in this crisis, right, a lot of, of evidence of people kind of connecting, of coming together. Um, in my own work, I have looked at how periods of uncertainty uh, change us um, as Americans. And um, the periods of uncertainty I have looked at in the past have been nothing like this. They've been you know, relatively moderate recessions over the last 50 years. But even in relatively moderate recessions, at least compared to the Great Recession or compared to the moment we're in right now, um, you see changes in how people interact. Um, so in, in one study I looked at, you know, kind of the values we try to instill in our children. Um, and one thing we find is that Americans tend to be overwhelmingly um, focused on developing children to be individualistic, to kind of stand on their own two feet, to think for themselves. Um, this is American individualism and you know, it has many benefits and it also has some costs as well. And one of the, the things I've found in my work is that um, in bad economic times, Americans tend to socialize their children um, to be a little bit less individualistic and a little more interdependent, to focus more on getting along with other people, on helping other people um, compared to um, good economic times, where the focus is much more on standing out um, and not on you know, building relationships. We also see this, I've also found this in my work in, in music. So our American music tends to be very individually focused. It tends to have a lot of first person singular pronouns, I, me, mine, um, and not very many collective um, pronouns. So uh, plural personal pronouns. So things like us, we, ours. And what I found in my work is that um, popular American music becomes less about I during recessions and it becomes more about we. And so when we think about how you know, uncertainty and collective crises um, tend to bring us together, um, it points out one of the really tremendous challenges of, of this particular pandemic. 
And that is that we're not supposed to physically be together, right? Um, so this is a really interesting tension that we're having in this period where our instincts tell us to come together, right? But we know from you know, a health perspective that that is not collectively in our best interest. So you know, how do we manage this? How do we both respond to this you know, pretty positive instinct to, to you know, affiliate, um, but also be mindful and thoughtful about you know, the need to socially distance to limit the spread of this virus? And you know, this is a huge tension um, in, in this particular period of time. Uh, we often think of, you know, when we don't socialize as much as we usually do, we often think of kind of the, the huge relationships in our lives that we're not, um, people we're not getting to see as much, right? Uh, maybe your parents or your grandkids or your, um, you know, good friends. But one thing that I think this pandemic has also revealed is how much value and joy and sense of purpose we get from the casual everyday interactions we have with people in our lives, people that we're not gonna connect with over Zoom in this particular crisis, right? People you see in the hallway every day at work, uh, people you talk with when you're um, you know, at a restaurant. Um, I, there was, I recently read an article in the Atlantic in which a, the author describes um, how much she misses those everyday interactions. And I think it, it very well sums up uh, the feeling that many people are having right now. And she writes, you know, I miss strangers. I long for connections with people I do not know. We're so separate now. We have so few opportunities for brief interactions. A random joke with someone in an elevator, a quip that turns into a conversation with a store clerk, even the banter with the chatty restaurant server. The pandemic has made me realize how much I need even the most casual interaction with strangers. Now, one thing I think many of us have found quite moving during this period is that people have found ways to safely connect, very creative ways to safely connect. Um, and, um, you know, you see lots of images of nursing homes, of people connecting through the glass. Um, you know, I, I think in my own world, um, you know, before the pandemic, um, my, and my, my husband's extended family lives all over, the, all over the world. And before the pandemic, we really, we rarely made it happen that we would all kind of regularly connect in a meaningful way. Um, weddings, of course, um, and it, you know, sometimes funerals, but other than that, not a lot. And one thing we found was that when the pandemic hit, we started having regular Zoom meetings with people who were all over the world and people who I hadn't seen since our own wedding. And I think that that is, you know, that's an experience I've heard from many people um, that, you know, yes, you, it's harder to connect in the kind of traditional ways that we usually do um, during periods of high uncertainty or just in everyday life. Um, but that desire to connect is so strong right now um, that we figured out ways to do, that, do it that we weren't doing before. Um, there have been some, you know, collectively really moving moments across the world um, in which people who are isolated in their own apartments, so this is a, an image from Italy um, back in March or April, and you can see that people are, you know, chatting or, or communicating or finding a way to be together while also being safely apart. Um, you know, there were some wonderful images of people kind of coming out of their window, you know, from their windows singing songs, playing instruments. Um, you saw that in New York where at seven o'clock when the shifts changed for the medical workers that people would, um, you know, open their windows and clap and cheer for them. And, you know, these again serve this need, um, are creative ways to serve this need for affiliation, for connection, for coming together. And you know, while we have been fortunate enough in this country that most of us do not remember a severe pandemic, um, you know, other countries have experienced one in fairly recent times. And some of the lessons that we've learned from those pandemics is that these moments do tend to bring us closer together in the long term. 
right? So one hope of, of small silver lining from all of the um, dark clouds of this, of this period um, is that it will kind of solidify or strengthen uh, relationships in people's lives. Um, so for instance, in Hong Kong, um, researchers asked people, you know, a year after the SARS epidemic, um, you know, how are you more, are you closer to your family and friends than you were before the pandemic? Or is it the same or is it even worse? And the majority of people reported that they were actually closer and very, very few reported that they were less close, right? So this could be a, you know, a small silver lining to a fairly um, dark cloud. Um, now, when I think of affiliation as a compensatory strategy, it's really one of the only positive ones I can think of. Um, the others that come to mind um, are either sort of neutral um, or very dark. And so I think they're important to think about collectively because you know, these aren't compensatory strategies we have to lean on. And there, you know, there are plenty of others um, that, that are much more adaptive and less harmful to people around us. Um, so a darker compensatory strategy that is incredibly well um, studied and understood in the literature um, is discrimination. So we have seen in pandemics throughout human history, in periods of economic uncertainty throughout human history, um, we have seen um, uh, an increase in discrimination and an increase in racially or ethnically or nationality uh, related violence. And so if you think of things like, uh, you know, the Black Plague in the Middle Ages, um, that was associated with massive violence in Europe, um, including, you know, the murder of clerics, of beggars, of Jews, of anybody who was perceived as an outgroup member and perceived to be responsible for the, um, for the illness. Um, in the Great Depression in the United States, um, you know, again, you saw some evidence of people coming together in the way I talked about before, but you also saw um, an increase in racial violence in the American South, um, a well-documented increase um, in violence against African-Americans. And in the you know, 1930s economic unrest in, in Germany, post-World War I Germany, um, is often attributed to the rise of, of the power of Adolf Hitler. So uh, historical examples abound um, of times when uncertainty, again, led us to easy, quick answers, um, and as a result, led us to kind of vilify and demonize people who are unlike ourselves. Um, my coworkers and I have looked at this in a more moderate periods of uncertainty. Um, so we've looked at racial attitudes over the course of the economic cycle. And what we have found is that in times of higher unemployment, um, there are more negative, uh, whites hold more negative racial attitudes or feelings about African Americans. Um, in other work, we have looked at um, implications this has for the success of, of Black Americans um, during bad economic times. Um, and in particular, we looked at the likelihood that African American singers would um, secure a top 10 hit or that African-American politicians would win a congressional election. And what we found was that the higher the unemployment rate, the more uncertainty there was in the collective environment, the less likely a black singer was to have a top 10 hit, right? Which requires a large population to purchase um, the music um, and the less likely a uh, black politician was to win a congressional election. And other research has looked at this um, across many, many countries and found um, that in regions of the world, or even within regions of a country in which pathogens are more prevalent, right? So you can imagine places in which disease has been more of a constant threat um, and other places in which it has been less of a constant threat. And what this research has shown is that in places with greater pathogen prevalence, um, greater uncertainty about what new pandemic might um, cross into one's community uh, next, that you see higher levels of xenophobia, um, you see higher levels of ethnocentrism, um, greater levels of fear and threat. 
from outsiders. And so when we think about kind of one of the things we have to be mindful of in this in this period is is strategies to mollify uncertainty that lead to the demonization of others. But it's really important to remember that it doesn't have to be this way, right? Like a, a pandemic does not have to pit us against each other. When we think of our group membership as broader than one country, one nationality, one you know religious group, one ethnic group, when we think of it as kind of a broader community of global citizens who are all fighting this pandemic, who all have a common destiny and common goal, we see, you know, we see less of this demonization of other humans and more of a demonization of a shared enemy, in this case, a virus. Um, and so we've seen some examples of this in the pandemic, which I'm hopeful will, you know, give us, uh, will, I'm hopeful indicate that we will see less of the discrimination that we've seen in past pandemics. Um, for instance, early on when, when China was struggling with this virus, um, over 20 countries donated medical supplies. Um, and since you know, China has passed through the worst of their phase of the virus, at least for now, um, they have reciprocated um, providing supplies to many other countries. So I think, you know, to the extent that we can highlight and remember kind of events like this, that we can think of, you know, the out group as not being, um, you know, people in a different racial category and a different uh, national category, but, you know, kind of this is a global collective effort um, in which we're all fighting a common non-human enemy. Um, so these are just some of the compensatory strategies that people use. Of course, there are many, many more, and some of them are, are very innocuous. They're quite harmless. Um, I, I have a colleague who recently, um, who writes a blog periodically, and recently in one of his blogs, he talked about how um, since, you know, his daughter had, had um, had to leave school, right, since her school had been closed and she was doing remote learning, um, they had developed a ritual every night in which after dinner they would watch this Netflix show called Nailed It. And what the show is is essentially a baking show with amateur bakers trying to create a, a beautiful cake or a beautiful product. Right? And um, it was kind of puzzling to him that, you know, after a whole summer of watching this, she still wanted to watch it. His eight-year-old daughter still wanted to watch it again and again and again and again. And what finally dawned on him was that the reason she wanted to do this was because it was predictable, right? There was some sense of order and predictability in doing this every night after dinner. And the show was pretty predictable, right? You always knew the cake wasn't going to work out. It was going to be a mess and it was going to be funny. And um, so, you know, there are all sorts of things like that we have done in, in this period of time, again, to provide pr predictability because the collective world outside our homes is so unpredictable right now. Um, you've seen people, you know, do all sorts of things with, with remodeling their homes, with recreating their spaces. And of course, some of this might be because um, you know, we're home more, right? And so, you know, the, the paint color we never liked is something we now have to live with all the time every day. And so we're, we're extra motivated to fix it. But, you know, there's another layer to it as well. And that is a layer of trying to provide control and trying to provide order to our environment. And, you know, there, and when we think of it that way, you know, we can kind of understand why we're doing what we're doing, um, and is this strategy actually helping us um, achieve uh, that reduction of uncertainty? But I think when we when we consider ways that this has collectively changed us, um, and perhaps even some of the positive sides of this, right? There's there's no question the costs have been huge in so many different ways. Um, but if we can kind of think about some of the ways that we've changed and that some of those ways might serve us going forward, um, you know, one of the, the possible positive aspects of this is our greater ability to manage and tolerate uncertainty. Um, you know, uncertainty is everywhere, right? As a, most Americans try to, you know, uh, 
often believe that, that there's a lot more control and certainty in their lives than they actually have. But if we stop and think about it, uncertainty is, is really everywhere, right? Every time we get in a car, every time we eat at a restaurant, we're accepting some level of uncertainty. We're trusting you know, that, that the other drivers will stop, um, that the traffic lights will work properly, um, that something won't, you know, a tree won't fall on the road, um, that the restaurant is pre preparing the food safely, right? We are accepting some sort of uncertainty. And of course, these things are incredibly unlikely, you know, to happen, that, that something would go wrong in those moments. Um, but I think it's important to recognize that we are accepting uncertainty all the time, that we do it all the time and we have the skills to manage it. So, Perhaps one of the lessons from this pandemic is that we can handle uncertainty, that we don't have to rely on these compensatory strategies, things like conspiracy theories or demonization of other people um, to regain our sense of control. That in some ways we can learn to live with it instead, that we already recognize that we already have the skills to manage it, that we just have to choose to use them. And, you know, some people have, um, you know, there's a lot of research suggesting that our ability to embrace uncertainty actually has a tremendous amount of rewards, can bring uh, significant rewards. Um, for instance, uncertainty drives the quest for knowledge, right? Um, the best scientists are those who recognize all they don't know and are curious to learn more about it, right? So at some level, they're accepting their uncertainty, um, their, um, their lack of knowledge, and motivated to try to understand better. And in addition, the ability to tolerate uncertainty is linked to greater creativity, right? If you think about it, to really consider new ideas or new possibilities, you have to be willing to sit with that feeling of not completely knowing. You have to be able to kind of rest in the unknown and not try to shut it down, which most of us, that is our instinct to do. And so when we think about this pandemic, perhaps it will give us greater comfort with the uncertainty that is inherent, inherent in life um, and greater strategies to, you know, when we feel the need to mitigate that uncertainty, to do it in a productive pro-social way, um, but also giving ourselves permission in some cases not to reduce that feeling of uncertainty, but instead to become more comfortable. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer any questions or I'm happy to hear your thoughts or um, other observations you have had about what you've seen um, in this in incredibly unusual time. Thank you so much, Emily. This has been great information this morning. Um, one of the first questions um, in the question box this morning um, asks, in the past, have reductions in levels of uncertainty over time led to commensurate changes in societal behavior, especially negative behavior that manifested due to levels of uncertainty? Or do these behaviors like discrimination continue even after uncertainty reduces? Um, yes, so that's an excellent question. Um, what we have seen in, in past work was that um, that levels of discrimination increase during recessions and that they then decrease during good times. And to be clear, it's not that they ever go away. Um, it's just that you see increases during bad economic times and decreases from, you know, a, 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 you know, a high starting point to begin with, um, but decreases during, during um, good economic times. So it is, you know, some of the, um, you know, evidence we've seen is there is a lot of fluctuation and, um, and it doesn't seem, at least in the periods we've looked at, which haven't, you know, been as catastrophic as the current moment, um, you know, we haven't seen long lasting effects uh, beyond what we already see, you know, as, as a high level of discrimination um, in American society. Thank you, Emily. How do you balance the new normal leading to acceptance of lower expectations, for instance, in job performance and motivation? Um, <laughs> that's a million dollar question. Um, so, 
you know, how do you balance it? I, I think everyone is constantly renegotiating that, right? Um, managers are constantly renegotiating that, employees are constantly renegotiating, renegotiating that. Um, you know, I think what this work suggests is that at some level, we don't exactly know what, what the future is going to look like. And so all we can do is, is manage our situation today, right? So for the next few weeks, what are we going to, what is that going to look like? Um, what are the expectations going to look like? And not trying to plan too far out because there are just too many unknowns, right? And, and being comfortable with that. Um, that's something that I've noticed a change really in myself over this period of time. I'm a planner. I like to have all of like the next, you know, four months really ironed out. And that's, you know, that's gone. And, and so it is the reality we're with. And in some ways, there's something sort of liberating about that. Um, once, you know, we really accept it. So I think just taking it one week at a time, one month at a time, adjusting in expectations as, you know, things hopefully improve um, and, and, you know, adjusting as, as things, you know, continue to change. Thank you. Do you have suggestions for how we can help our employees slash teams function better in these uncertain times when we ourselves are dealing with uncertainty? Yeah, so I think, you know, the thing I found most helpful in my own life and with you know, people in my family and, and my work life has been just to acknowledge it, right? This is very uncertain. There, this, these moments are very uncertain. Um, you know, we all have strategies for managing that, but I think really recognizing that has been really valuable. Um, you know, one legacy I hope our kids will get from this, right? I, I have three small children. Um, and, you know, one thing I keep hearing parents worry about is the long-term effect this will have on them. And, you know, of course, we all worry about that. We worry about our kids no matter what the conditions are. But, um, you know, I think one aspect of this is, you know, they've been, for the most part, most kids have been very resilient in this time. And, um, you know, I think, I think it's giving them more familiarity with uncertainty, right? Um, so I have one kid who, who is particularly like me, who likes to know exactly when is she going back to school? What's it going to look like? What date? And over this period, I think that the best thing that I've tried to do for her, I mean, who knows, we'll see, but is to say, I don't know. We don't know. And to not try to, you know, as our, our general parental or, or boss, like, um, norms would suggest is to say, oh, it's going to be this, oh, it's going to be this. But we're all living in this uncertainty and, and it just is, right? Um, and so to the extent that we can really acknowledge it, um, and I think that in itself helps reduce it a little bit or helps reduce the fear and anxiety associated with it, right? One of the most frustrating things is when people are like, oh, it's not that bad or it's not that unpredictable or there's so much we have control over. It's like, I think we need to recognize collectively our, our lack of control at this moment. Um, and to the extent that we really want to get rid of that feeling, do some of the productive things we've talked about um, and to try to reduce that uncertainty. Emily, in dealing with change and uncertainty, how would you suggest that a visionary, a planner, a corporation, et cetera, frame the change? Frame the... Um, how do you suggest that we incorporate problems in our benefits that we're experiencing and um, having to deal with in mm -hmm. part of the change? Yeah, so I think, um, I think one of the things that this work reveals or, or the uncertainty literature in general reveals is um, the importance of being completely transparent. That, um, you know, what we find, uh, one of the kind of most illuminating findings, I think, um, that I covered today is work showing that people who are fearful of losing their jobs are more are struggling health wise and psychologically to a greater extent than people who have lost their jobs. And what that says to me is that for most of us, the unknown is actually more terrifying than the for for many of us, not everybody than the actual experience of the bad outcome. So from a managerial perspective, what that suggests is complete transparency. Um, here are the things we're considering. Here's our, you know, here's how we have struggled in this time. Here's how our finances have taken a hit. Here's what, you know, kind of um, courses of action we're considering. I think just that, you know, again, that 
people are more scared of the bad of, of the uncertainty than the bad outcome is what generally we find. So, um, you know, giving some more information can help uh, reduce that con those concerns, even if that information is negative. Thank you. Um, Emily, there's a comment here um, that, that noted you mentioning the good and bad compensatory strategies for groups, but um, they're asking if you could speak to good and bad individual compensatory strategies, such as drinking, uh, over overeating versus exercising, those types of things. Can you comment yeah. on that? I mean, there are as many strategies as there are people, right? Um, and we have seen some of them which have been in quite negative, right, during these periods, um, and, and which many of us can relate to, um, you know, uh, um, like you mentioned. Um, but there are also many positive ones, right? People who have, um, you know, decided to take up an instrument or people who have decided to, um, you know, now train for a marathon. Um, so, you know, there are as many, again, as many good and bad strategies, almost as many as there are people. But, you know, I think it's, it's, it's helpful to think and to understand kind of our motivation behind doing what we're doing. And if it's a bad strategy, the one that we want to change, then we can recognize why we're engaging in that strategy and understanding whether or not that strategy is serving us well. And is there another strategy that we could use that might be more productive or that might be um, have better kind of health consequences for us individually? Emily, you mentioned people connecting and supporting each other during this pandemic, as well as Hong Kong feeling more connected a year after SARS. And we experienced something similar after 9-11. Does the connectedness deteriorate over time? And if so, why? Yeah, I mean, as it, there's no question. There was, there's incredible accounts of, um, you know, social connection and, um, and affiliation after 9-11. Um, and yes, we saw that for, for a period of time. And yes, it does dissipate over time. Um, why does it dissipate? Because, um, you know, our, our need for order, our need for certainty, our need for control dissipates as the threat dissipates, right? Um, as the threat kind of, you know, as it became November, December, 2002, 2003, right? That kind of immediate threat or fear dissipated. Um, and so, so too does our need to kind of collectively affiliate. Thank you, um, Emily. As a follow on to the question regarding legacy of negative behavior, can you speak to the impact of other communities? Um, the comment here says, while the behaviors may change on the part of those who enact them, it seems as though it would set a different baseline of anxiety and uncertainty for the people within those communities. That's a great point. Yeah, and we see that certainly. Um, um, so we, we certainly see the impact of being for and I assume you're talking about being, uh, you know, on the receiving end of discrimination, right. Um, and what we see um, in a lot of literature is being on the receiving end of, of discrimination um, is associated with greater anxiety is associated with greater cardiovascular problems, greater rates of heart disease. Um, and so would we expect that to increase? Probably. Um, I haven't seen systematic research on that, but certainly um, the research I have seen on being on the other end of discrimination, um, being a target of discrimination suggests that we would see negative health effects and those probably would last. Emily, one of our attendees this morning commented that um, during the last three recessions, his response has been more education and new skill sets. However, the response has been longer periods without work and when a job is secured, realizing lower pay. Is this the new normal? Uh, you know, I don't know. <laughs> I don't think anybody really knows. Um, I certainly hope not. Um, but going back to school is a very common, you know, strategy and, and a very strategic um, move during recessions. And, and you know, research has suggested it's it's a it's a um, a pretty effective way to, especially if you're early in your career, a pretty effective way to kind of ride out a bad period of uh, of the economy. Um, you know, in terms of what's going to happen in the future, 
I don't know. I would certainly hope that um, that wouldn't be true, but my prediction wouldn't be more accurate than anyone else's, so I can't say. Thank you, Emily. And I think we have time for one more question. Uh, this is a rather long comment <laughs> and question, um, but it states, based on current statistics from the NIH and CDC and various other state agencies, um, and more accurate reporting of the true death rate from coronavirus, it seems that the reactions from the virus threat is, is way overblown. This is the comment. Um, most of these reactions are politically driven and not based on the threat of the true, I think the true threat of the, the death rate. Do you foresee this changing after the election? <laughs> um. I don't know. I think I, I, you know, people's assessment of threat is based on so many different things. Yeah, in the, in this current moment, we've seen it. it there's no question that it is um, different along political lines, right? You see a lot more uh, a higher percent perception of threat, um, you know, among among Democrats, and you see a lower perception of threat among Republicans. Um, you know, you saw the opposite following 9/11. So, you know, how that plays out is is you know, part of a whole bunch of different factors, um, you know, in terms of changing after the election. First, it depends on, you know, how the election plays out, right? Who wins? But, um, you know, all of these things are, you know, really multi-determined and they're very hard to disentangle. Um, but yes, our perception of threat is not always a response to the actual statistics or the actual, um, you know, objective uh, measure of that threat, but they're they're very much culturally um, construed. And that's true with a whole bunch of host of different threats, whether it's the pandemic um, or, or any other sort of, of threat. And so yes, they are socially constructed and you know the extent to which you feel a threat um, probably depends on the um, groups with which you identify. So thank you so much, Emily. This was a great topic for this Thursday's Business Over Breakfast webinar series. We really appreciate you joining us. And we appreciate you, our attendees, that come back each and every Thursday to join us for Business Over Breakfast. Um, just a couple of things to wrap us up before we let you all get on with your days today. Um, of course, as always, a copy of this recording for this webinar will become available on the Emory Executive Education LinkedIn page later on today. Um, we've got a couple of more topics coming up this month in September. We hope that you all will join us next week uh, with Emory Goizueta faculty member Carl Kuhnert for Emotional Intelligence um, this next Thursday, September 17th, same time, 9 a.m. Um, and also, we just want to let you know about some upcoming virtual courses and workshops that we're offering within Emory Executive Education. The link to access more information about these particular courses is located in the chat box. Um, in just a couple of moments, you will see a brief survey pop up on your screen. We'll just ask that you take one to two minutes to fill out that survey, give us some feedback on today's session. Again, thank you all so much for joining us. Emily, any final comments before we wrap up today? No, I'm happy to answer any questions over email that people have. Um, and thank you so much for your time. And I look forward to hopefully seeing you all in person one day. Wonderful. Thanks, Emily. And thank you all. We appreciate you.